Hey there, church. Welcome to Church at Home. We are so glad that you have decided to join us this morning. If this is your first time connecting with Church at Home, we want to say a very special welcome. We are so glad that you're here and that you have chosen to join us this morning. But we'd love to know that you're here. So please introduce yourself in the chat, connect with our Facebook page, or contact the office and introduce yourself. We would love to connect with you more. We're very excited right now because we are entering into stage three of our roadmap forward. And stage three is we are resuming on-site services. So from Sunday, August 2nd, we're going to have two services on-site at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And then we'll also have an online option uh, in the evenings at 5 p.m. We're looking forward to being able to worship with you both in person and online from that date. But we're also really excited about Sunday, July 26, where we have a volunteers and leaders reset gathering. It is really important before we come back together as a church that we make sure that we start off on the right foot. So we want to have a reset gathering from 2 p.m. on Sunday, July 26, where we can have an opportunity to come together and make sure that we are starting strong with the values and the cultures that we want here at Devonport Church of Christ. So if you volunteer in the life of the church or if you're a leader in the life of the church, we would love to see you there. Please refer to the email that went out this week for details. You will need to register for that online as part of our COVID safe plan. So please either register through the email or on the link on our website. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. Let us worship our great God together. Amen. One, two, three, four. It's all God's 
Well, good morning, church. Today, we are beginning a a new two-part series called God, Money, and Me. And I thought it'd be a really cool idea to have a conversation with Dominic, who is the our CAP Debt Centre Manager for Christians Against Poverty. Been the, the, the manager now for, for since 2015. And Dom has literally had hundreds of conversations with people talking about, in their homes, talking about money management, uh, talking about their finances, budgeting, and also debt. And uh, money is an important subject to God, and money is an important subject uh, for us to understand as a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. So it was a big deal for Jesus. And it's also, as you and I know, it's a big deal in our lives as well. So Dom, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, great to be here, Blake. Really good to, to be here in the church. Looking forward to being back here in not too distant future. Amen. Amen to that. So Dom, just uh, first question um, to start this morning. Um, what are some of the main issues that you see the, the average person has with understanding money? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that uh, the biggest point that um, I've found in talking to a lot of people is that they they struggle to talk about um, money and and their situation with money, but they also struggle to understand the difference between needs and wants, and actually being deliberate about defining what do I need and what are the what are the wants that are off the side that cost me money, but um, yeah, just being able to put that definition in place. Yeah, is it is it people understanding? you know, spending money that they don't have to really sometimes to buy stuff that they don't really need. A hundred percent. And quite often when you actually, uh, in my experience, especially with CAP, uh, when you look at the, the money that actually has been spent, sometimes it's on things that people do need, but they've just spent too soon. They've actually gone into debt to actually get something that they needed rather than actually budgeting and saving and then spending and it's a it's a really critical difference is mm. we all have needs in life and there's access to easy money around and um, it's about saying well what's the best thing for me in my circumstances and with the income that I have mm. you yeah, know that's great what are in your experience working with Christians Against Poverty um, trying to release people from from the I guess I use the word bondage of, of, of debt. What are some of the big no-nos when it comes to debt? Yeah, big no-nos. There's, there's, there's quite a few that you could actually go into, but I, I think the big no-nos with debt is, is the easier the money is to get, generally the, the higher interest rate and the more burdensome it comes uh, if you can't pay it back. If you can't afford it, if you haven't gone through your budget and actually worked out, I can afford to do this, um, then you actually can really get into um, the bondage of debt very quickly. Um, and generally, unsecured debt is one of, the, one of the ones that actually will send you down to a place of um, being bound by that debt or being um, tied up in debt very quickly. Yeah, so, so most, most people, we're talking about bad debt. I mean, most people have to get a mortgage to, to get an asset, to get, get a home. Um, but you're, you're more talking about credit cards, store cards, is that? Yeah, credit cards, store cards, um, they're, they're very practical ways. As I've, I've, I say to a lot of people, I've had a credit card for over 20 years. Um, I became very frustrated once when I actually paid interest on that credit card. Um, I've paid $50 interest in, all, in the time that I've had a credit card. We wow. use it on a regular basis, but I use it in a way where we pay it off before interest is charged. And I know that's not everybody's circumstance, and sometimes you get to the place where you need to need to have it and there's interest paid, but you really need to look at the structure of how am I going to pay this off so it doesn't become a burden. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. Um, what are, I always believe that people can make a, a healthy regardless of what choices people make in whatever areas in life it is, whether it's money or relationships, that I believe that people can make a a good choice today that's going to help them and bless them tomorrow. Uh, In terms of what what kind of good choices and and habits can people start doing today? Maybe they've had a, 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 a track record that hasn't been that great with how can they make it? What's the good choices and habits they can start doing today? 
I think there's there's probably three points that I'd like to make here, and I, I'll, I'll mention um, John Kohler at this point. He actually said something to me very early in the cap journey around that a dollar saved is worth more than a dollar earned. Mm. And a lot of people don't realise that. You save a dollar, it's a dollar. If you earn a dollar, you've got to pay tax on it. So every time, just looking at areas where you can actually save in your in your spending is number one. Number two would be um, understanding that we all have life and we have life um, uh, milestones that you actually go through. So I'm going through one at the moment. I've got a wedding that we're, we're having in a, in a 10 days time, which is fantastic, but weddings cost money. So planning for those things in the future, planning for 18th birthdays, 21st birthdays, mm. 50th birthdays, um, mm. and actually understanding that side of things is really well. But the, the key to all that is actually budget. So you actually sit down and talk about money, you actually budget, you save and then you spend. So actually getting things in that order is really important. Um, the budgeting is about looking at what are the things we would like to do, um, what are our daily day-to-day -day needs, but what are the things we'd like to do, and then planning for those into the future. Um, so I tend to do a five-year and a 10-year look ahead, oh, wow. what, what's going on. Um, we're getting through some of our major expenses on those, those plans as a, as a family, but looking ahead enough so that you can actually plan it because if you'd go to the other extreme and you actually do it haphazardly, you actually end up being in a place where you spend, then you stress and you end up being in debt. And, yeah. and I think that that's a, um, being a good steward. It's all a part about planning how we actually use the resources we've been given. Yeah, for sure. Um, I believe the enemy, we have an enemy, mm -hmm. um, wants to bind people up in debt. 100%. They can't get out there, there's no... They can't get the fruit and they're just bound up, wound up, it just consumes their lives. Yeah. Like quite often a lot of people will actually put um, debt, especially in society, um, down to um, different addictions. And the easy ones are, you know, your alcohol and drugs and things like that. Mm. But we all have the, um, the tendency for a spending addiction. There are things that we like to spend money on um, and they're more filling those wants. And those wants are uh, where the enemy attacks. Yeah. He actually says to you, oh, you can spend money on this. So I just go online and... and you know, and find something else to fill that addiction. You so you've got to be it. really yeah. careful yeah. about what those wants are and actually managing them. Yeah, no, that's great. So, Dom, the series, the two-week series is called God, Money and Me. Um, when you hear those three words, God, money and me, what, what, what comes to mind? It's quite, a, quite an interesting thing to think about it. I mean, I grew up in a non-Christian family, but from the day that I gave my life to Christ, the challenge on my heart was to actually, was to tithe, was actually to give back to God. And I became very aware very quickly that everything that I have is, is God's anyway. So he allows me to actually have that resource of money um, and giving something back to him is, is really important. We need to be good stewards of what we have. Um, so... Uh, I'd say to a lot of people, if you if you don't have a budget, you you either have too much money or you're in debt. <laughs> so uh, sitting down and actually planning what I'm doing with my money is a very godly thing. It's actually to to say to God, this is worth what you've given to me is worth so much that I need to actually do it well. I have to actually um, use my money well. Um, so my responsibility as a steward is really important. So. God gives it to me. Money is important. Jesus, as you said, spoke about it a lot. Um, and I think he spoke about it a lot because it can be a real, it can, it can end up being, when you're in debt, a real burdensome thing. It actually causes a lot of stress, a lot of arguments. Mm. And um, doing it well is so important for my own mm. spiritual work and my own health. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was thinking that, like, I, at school, when I went to school, they never had, had they never taught this in the classroom. Um, I can't recall my parents ever sitting me down to teach me money management skills. It, it's 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 so important, but so many people just don't. We don't talk about it. Yeah. We don't talk about it anywhere near enough. And I think it, um, it, it seems to be something that weighs heavily on the minds of a lot of people all the time. And I think that um, taking the opportunity in your families to sit down and talk about it. Um, there are some really good tools to sit down with kids, especially when they're at an age where they understand what income is in coming into the household. Uh, I think it's really important for them to understand that everybody's not, is different. Some people earn more money than other people and, mm. and that's the way the world is and we've got to operate in that world. So mm. talk about it, budget and actually plan milestones. 
I know my kids got excited about planning their own milestones for their budgets as well. Yeah, so. okay. Wow, that's great. That's so good. Um, Dom, the, the reality is that uh, if someone's watching this morning and uh, maybe wanted to, has realised that, that they're in a bit of trouble, mm -hmm. um, then it's maybe simply of just ringing the CAP hotline or yep. um, having a chat with you um, to be able to sit down and to navigate a way forward. There's always a way forward, isn't there? Uh, definitely, always a way forward. And um, the CAP number, 1300 227 000, is, uh, is a great way to start. If you feel uncomfortable about doing that, then, hey, I'm, I'm here. Um, if you need more details, you can contact the church. Um, there's email addresses you can send to. Love to have a conversation. And, and don't have to be in a place where you're actually feeling like you're struggling with the debts around you. Even if you just want to sit down and actually go through a budget, and um, we have cap money courses that actually can help you with budgeting and actually be a good steward of your money. Mm. The only other thing that I'd like to, to say about debt is that one thing you need to actually understand is that whatever form of debt you go into, you're actually giving money to someone else. So someone's getting rich off the back of debt. Mm. And I mentioned to Blake this morning, even with Afterpay as a share price, it's $68. It means that someone's making some big money out of it. Yep. Um, so... Being a good steward is actually also un understanding where does your money go to and what is it supporting in the world. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah that's great. Well, thanks, Dom, for, for joining us uh, this morning at Church at Home. We really appreciate it. And again, if you uh, have any questions, send Dom an email. Uh, he'd love to have, have a chat with you. But we really, um, Jesus said he's come to give life and life abundantly. And uh, that's in all areas. And that also includes your finances. And so uh, we need to let Jesus into the financial area of our life. Thanks so much, Dom. God bless. Have you ever found yourself in a disagreement with somebody you love over the subject of money? Somebody wants to spend and somebody wants to save. Somebody wants to go out and eat at a restaurant and the other person wants to save money and cook at home. Did you know that nearly 50% of couples who get divorced do so because of disagreements and fights over money. In addition to that, for approximately 70% of newlyweds, money is the number one issue that causes most of their arguments in the first year. I don't care who you are this morning. We all need to admit that money has more authority over our lives than we may have considered. Money has authority over us, does it not? It informs daily decisions, determines where we live, where we work, our level of debt, and practically all other life-shaping decisions. You may tell yourself that money does, doesn't have any authority over you, but really, I mean, how many times have you promised yourself that you will do something significant with your life paused and then said probably when we've have a little bit more time when we've saved a little bit more money once we've paid off that loan and we've we've got ahead when we've got enough savings how often have you f felt yourself react when the church talks about money and, and you think to yourself man does that guy think that I'm made of money some of you may be feeling that way right now you see, money has more authority over you than you realise. We're spending the next two weeks in a series called God, Money and Me. And this series is not about tithing, even though we will talk about that particularly next week. But it's about financial freedom. And it's about instilling biblical principles into your money management. And if there is one thing that, it's tr that is true, you manage your money or your money will manage you. Today, I want to unpack a number of biblical principles of giving and some myths about God and money. And, and then next week, unpack these principles that can apply to you and I. You see, it's not the will of God for us as Christians to struggle throughout our entire lives just living week to week, paycheck to paycheck. Allow me to begin this morning and begin this series with a quote 
from the 18th century by theologian John Wesley. And John Wesley said this, you need to earn all you can, you need to save all you can, and you need to give all you can. It's not just one paradigm. And that's what we're going to talk about, particularly in week two. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8 says this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This morning, I want to start off by talking about the reward of giving and the right heart. The reward of giving and the right heart. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, and the context is that Paul is exhorting the church in taking up a free will love offering to support the church in Jerusalem who were, found themselves in difficult and hard times. He wanted one church to support the mission and ministry of another. And Paul was clear that he was after generosity of spirit. He was after generosity, not grudging obligation. And generosity from a biblical viewpoint has more to do with our attitude, Paul says, than it even has to do with the amount. When God gives us grace, when God gives us his grace, he's not reluctantly giving us his grace with like one little finger open and the rest of his fist clenched, full of gifts. I would tell you today that when it comes to God and his grace towards you and I, that God's hands are nail-pierced and they are wide open towards you and I. This fountain of grace is always pouring itself out to us with no end, at least on heaven's side. Paul says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. When we read the Bible, there is this principle of sowing and reaping. And it applies to our lives today as well. You see, a farmer sowing seed may feel that as he sows the seed, that he's losing seed as it falls to the earth, as it falls to the ground. And we may feel that when we give to the church or or to a missionary or another organization, that we are losing when we give. But just as the farmer gives the seed an anticipation of a future harvest, we should give with the same heart. Like if a farmer planted only a few seeds, only decided to plant a few seeds because he wanted to hold on to as much seed as he could, he would end up having more seed in his barn after sowing time. But at the harvest, the one who planted more seed is in fact and indeed going to have more grain in his barn we we also reap bountifully paul says well what do we reap when we give we reap blessings that are both material and spiritual materially we can trust that god will provide for the for our needs and for the, the person who has a giving heart. The promise of Philippians chapter 4, 19, what does that say? It says that my God shall supply all your needs, not some, that, that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is the giving heart in the context of the Philippians the church in Philippi. Like if we give to God, he will give to us materially. Now, before you start to panic and think, man, is this guy talking about prosperity doctrine? No, I'm talking about put God first. I'm talking about seeking God first. 
we seek God first, we put God first in our finances, and, and all these other things are going to be taken care of. Jesus said that in, in, in Matthew's Gospel. And that includes our, da- our daily needs. Spiritually, we can trust that God rewards the giving heart, both now in this life and also in eternity. Jesus spoke about this in, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Jesus obviously did not mean that we're going to receive a hundred houses if we gave up a house. Or he's not saying that if you had to give up your wife that you're going to get a hundred wives. He's not saying that at all. But he did mean that when we give, that we never lose. We, when we give to God, we never lose. The Lord can never be in any debt to any man or any woman. And we should never be afraid of giving God too much. You see, the truth is spiritually or materially, you can't outgive God. We can't outgive God. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And he says, Paul says, so let each one. Let each one give. Paul is saying that giving is for each one. Giving is for every Christian. Every Christian should be a giver. Why should every Christian be a giver? Well, because we know that God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, as children of God, we want to be givers as well. Paul is saying that every Christian, everyone should give. Now, because of small resources, someone can't give as much as the, as the other. And we'll talk about that next week. It's, it's not about equal giving, but it sure is about equal sacrifice. But everyone can give. And it's about giving with the right heart and the right attitude. And Paul says, as he purposes in his own heart, giving must be motivated by the purposes of our own heart. It should never be coerced or manipulated. We should give because we want to give because of what God has done for us and because God has put it and placed it in our heart to give and be generous. And this can also be said in the sense, in the context that giving reveals the purposes in our own heart. Giving reveals the purposes in our own heart. If we say that we love the Lord Jesus, I don't know, more than surfing, but we spend all our money on surfboards and do not give as we should to the Lord's work, then the way we spend our money shows the purposes of our own heart more accurately than our words do. Jesus said that, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said it simply, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And Paul goes on, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Let me talk about having sufficiency in all things. God is able to make all grace abound towards us and have sufficiency in all things. Have sufficiency in some things? No, have sufficiency in all things. In fact, the ancient Greek word right for sufficiency is this word autakia and it may also be translated as contentment. Contentment never comes from external things. We We know that. But but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. God wants to bless us abundantly so that we'll be able to abound and have abundance for every good work and to meet every good work. We We are blessed 
to be a blessing. Sure, you can bless somebody with your prayers. We know that. We've just spent 40 days uh, learning about that. That's vital. But you can make a difference in your generosity. You can make a difference in your giving. You can make a difference with your money. Money can start programs. Money can build buildings. Money can birth ministries. Money can change a person's life. Money is a resource that seeds ministries that changes lives. Like if you don't have any money, then you don't have any seed. And if you don't have any money, you can, you can see a need, but you can't meet that need, and that's a fact. God's grace will make us content with our money, but also free us up to meet the needs of every good work. Paul says. Well, this morning, what are some well-known myths about money that Christians are deceived by? And I use that word deceive because don't forget that Satan, uh, our enemy, wants to deceive us about money. He has a goal and his goal is to steal, kill and also to destroy. And he wants to restrict our ability to to break through and have freedom in the area of our finances. Satan loves debt. Man, he does. Satan loves uncontrolled debt. And when a Christian gets themselves into, into, you know, uh, unrestrained debt, then he knows that they can't release or support the purposes of God through their finances. So this morning... I want to overturn some common myths that the devil has been peddling to Christians for years. I want to give you six myths. And here's myth number one. Myth number one. Money is not something we should focus on. Money is not something we should focus on. If, if, if money is what decides where you can live and what you can do and what your future looks like, if money controls where you work, if money brings an answer to need, to those in need, why wouldn't we talk about it? Why wouldn't we focus upon it? Even better than that, if Jesus during his three-year ministry, three-year journey to the cross, spoke more about money than heaven and hell combined than any other subject in the Gospels, why would we think that we wouldn't focus on it and, and, and talk about it, about the issue of money? Do you know that 11 of the 39 parables that Jesus spoke and that are recorded in the Gospels talk about the issue of money? Scripture talks more about money than it does faith. Now, money is not more important than faith, but but. Scripture is talking more about money than faith. There are 215 verses pertaining to faith. There are 218 verses to salvation. And there's 2,058 dealing with stewardship and accountability for money. The world's debt is in excess of $58 trillion. Let me just help you understand That's 58 with 12 zeros on the end. Do you still think that we shouldn't talk about money? Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 says this, The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, if you don't think that's true, next time you miss your loan repayment or don't pay your rent and and see what happens. What does King Solomon mean in that verse? He's saying that if you are in a place where you're in debt that is unsustainable, you are no longer in a place of freedom. That was myth number one. What about myth number two? Well, myth number two is this. God's blessings are not material. God's blessings are not material. Well, this is a big myth. When God created man... And then blessed them. God said this in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Friends, we have been created to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew records the parable of the talents. You know the parable. Three servants are highlighted as receiving talents from their master. Talents were basically a lot of money, a lot of resource. One servant had five talents, the other had two talents, and the, other, and the third servant was given one talent. And at the end of the parable, the master returns, and the one who he rebuked, the one who was rebuked by the master, was the one who didn't multiply what he had. He was loyal, but he didn't multiply. True faithfulness, according to Jesus, and according to his teachings in Matthew chapter 25, is the combination of loyalty and fruitfulness. Don't forget that, loyalty and fruitfulness. And according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, we should be living at a level most of us have never, ever experienced yet. People say, money can't make me happy. You heard that before? Money can't make you happy. And the truth is that that's right. But here's what they don't say. Money can make life more pleasant. People say, money's not the ultimate answer. And that's right. Money is not the ultimate answer. But it does provide a lot of answers to a lot of people. Myth number three. But the Bible teaches that money is evil. But the Bible teaches that money is evil. Money is not evil. Money is neutral. Money is not evil. Money is neutral. And the verse that is most often misquoted on this is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6.10, where it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. It's the love of money. It's, Jesus says, loving money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money in itself, but the love of money. Did you know you would have heard of Bill Gates before? Bill Gates, who is the founder of Microsoft, on one single day, Bill Gates donated $28 billion to charity to help feed the poor. $28 billion on one single day to help feed the poor. I mean, don't you dare tell me that money is evil. Money's not evil. Money is neutral. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. You know, God, God wants to supply some things to enjoy. Uh, God's not upset about that, toy, that favourite toy that you have or that boat or that car. But it's just, we're not to, it's not to be our lives. It's not to be our life's pursuit. Well, what about myth number four? Myth number four, Jesus modelled scarcity. Jesus modelled scarcity. You know, people say, you know what? Jesus lived the life of a poor carpenter and he lived a life of scarcity. You know, what about Mother Teresa? Uh, isn't it something that everybody knows that holiness is found in a life of poverty? You know, Jesus lived, Jesus lived a meagre life. So shouldn't we also do that? Well, there is no doubt that God indeed has special callings for people like Mother Teresa, who through their life and through their menial existence comes great supernatural power, breakthrough, and also influence. But this doesn't mean that every Christian should live with nothing. If I were like Mother Teresa, there, there are two compassion kids that would never, ever get sponsored. Nobody would have been able to support the work of Mother Teresa. Nobody would be able to fund Empart's work. Jesus' ministry lasted three years and he did live a meagre life. He never owned a house on earth, particularly because he didn't need it. But Jesus' ministry 
was never about scarcity. It was never about just providing enough. I mean, he fed 5,000 people and there were 12 baskets left over. In fact, think about this. In heaven, pavement is gold. God says, it's fine as a Christian for you to have stuff. Just don't let that stuff own you. That was the message to the rich young ruler. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 30 says, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this, in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus did not preach a gospel of prosperity or a gospel of scarcity. He modeled a life of going without so that you and I could step up into the promise of abundance, providing an answer to the world in which we live. Myth number five. Myth five, God's kingdom doesn't need money. God's kingdom doesn't need money. Money should not rule us but it can release the kingdom by the correct use of it. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's kingdom to come. And where do we pray for God's kingdom to come? We pray for God's kingdom to come where? On earth. How does that happen? Oh, I'm, I'm serious. Like, how, how does that happen? You just pray for it? Well, yeah, you pray for it, but how does that happen? How does that come? Here's a question. How does that come without supply? We are in partnership with God to see his kingdom become a reality here on earth. Why? Because God works through human beings. You read the Bible throughout all of salvation history, throughout all of human history, God has always achieved his purposes through people. In a few weeks' time, hopefully, we'll be back, be back here in this building. The church will come back to a building. How did this building get built? Well, somebody back in 1954, a group of people back in 1954 thought it'd be a pretty good idea to purchase these five blocks of land and uh, then build on it in 1954 and then upgrade again in the year 2000. Who paid for that? Who paid for the camera that I'm speaking through to you right, right now? the camera that enables us to, for the last three months to bring you church at homes. Uh, who, who, who paid for that? Who is financing the Daring Faith upgrades, building upgrades? Do you know what? The Archangel Gabriel never dropped it off to my office last week. At least I'm pretty sure that, that didn't happen. How did it happen? That happened through faithful saints like you. Faithful saints who place God first in their finances, week in and week out. That's who's done these things. And the enemy is trying to continually keep God's work weak through a lack of supply, through money, and also twisting Christians' mindsets about money. Please don't tell me that we should not focus on money. Because no matter where you are at with God in terms of your finances, God's purposes always needs more. I love this next verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 18 says, Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. <laughs> Myth 6. Myth six, it would be different if I had more. It would be different if I had more. Do you really believe that? It would be different if I had more. I'll do this when I, I'll, I'll do this when, when I can. Here's the truth about every single person who's watching this today. Everybody has seed 
that can produce a harvest for tomorrow. I'm going to say that again. Every one of us has seed that can produce a harvest for tomorrow. Today's responses will determine tomorrow's outcomes. Today's responses will determine tomorrow's outcomes. People say, you know, I'll start being generous and giving when I get a better job. You know, like, like, you know what, Pastor, like if circumstances were different, you know, if the kids didn't need braces, you know, if my husband worked more hours, no, 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 no. You say to me, you know, Pastor, you know, I just can't afford to give. No, no, no. You can't afford not to. You really can't. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I want to close with this story this morning. An old and damaged $1 coin discovered that it was about to be retired from circulation. And as it slowly moved along the conveyor belt, it became acquainted and it struck up a conversation with a $100 note who was also meeting the same fate. Well, the $100 note began reminiscing about his life and travels all over the world and all over the country. Yeah, he said, you know, life has been good. The $100 note exclaimed, why well, I've been to Star City Casino, the finest restaurants in Melbourne, political fundraisers, and I've just returned from a cruise in the Caribbean. Gee, the $1 coin said, you sure have been fortunate enough to visit all those amazing, wonderful places. So where have you been in your lifetime? Said the, the 100 Well... The $1 coin says, well, I've been to the Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Presbyterian church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church, the Orthodox church, the AOG church, the Brethren church, the Quaker church, the Pentecostal church, Charismatic church, and the church of Christ. Excuse me, says the $100 note, but what's a church? A little cheeky? Maybe a kernel of truth for some Christians. Absolutely. This is the word of the Lord to you today.
Hey church, thanks for joining us today for, ch for Church at Home. And uh, I do pray that some of the principles I've spoken about today, that you would go away and uh, seek the Lord, read the scriptures and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about the issue of money in your Christian discipleship. Uh, next week uh, is going to be really important as well as we unpack uh, some principles uh, to help you uh, in your money management, just some practical things in terms of uh, spending and saving. Um, you may have heard this statement before. It goes something like this. Money doesn't grow on trees. And that's true. But money does grow on generational trees. And we're going to talk about that issue next week. So I really look forward to that. Church, I want to give a special moment right now and a special shout out on behalf of the Devonport Church of Christ to both Brendan and Abby who this coming Saturday are going to become husband and wife. Husband and wife, how cool is that? And they were at the peak of COVID-19. They were going to get married in, in April, but at the peak of COVID-19, they had to postpone that. And that was, that's been a long and difficult journey for them. Uh, but I, I want to ask you to be praying for them this coming week and praying for, for Saturday, this coming Saturday, that it just be just an amazing day filled with much love, grace, and blessings. So congratulations, Brendan and Abby. And on behalf of Devonport Church of Christ and your, your friends and family here, we're going to extend our, yes, all our love and blessings to you for your special day. Thank you, church. We'll see you next week. God bless.